So let's welcome Dr. Hulamu. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for having me here. It's an, it's an great honor to introduce our research, share our research with the public. Um, and again, my topic today is unmanned aerial systems, um, using that for uh, food and water security in, in a changing climate. So I'm going to talk about um, uh, several uh, aspects related to this talk. One is remote sensing, what, what say remote sensing, right? And then um, and current advances in remote sensing on many aerial systems and its application is a uh, number of areas I'm going to talk about. So what say remote sensing? And, um, and every day, like, you open your eyes, you use remote sensing to see things from a distance, right? Without touching it, without uh, being in a distance. So in a distance, you can see things, you can um, and, and make estimate of things. That's a remote sensing you use everyday life. But the remote sensing we use here is, I'm talking about is, um, we, we have systems and sensors deployed on satellites, on manned aerial systems, aircrafts, and that's used to uh, look at a whole bunch of issues from water to food, environment, and what's going on, and human geography and, and issues uh, like that. So um, that's what a, 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 a definition of remote sensing in a simple uh, term. So I'm going to show you several um, uh, uh, photos here. This is at St. Louis University campus. A concrete paveway, right? And we, we every day we, we see around. And then um, this is a stressed short fescue grass and you see it's a little bit uh, brightish or something. And then down here is really healthy uh, fescue grass. And then two box trees, one is a little bit stressed and then the other one is dark green. And one of my PhD students is holding a remote sensing instrument on this backpack and then scanning that, that uh, two box trees and collecting remote sensing data sets. Um, both of those are water and, and basically under the, the, the bottom of this um, uh, uh, pan here is, is uh, kind of uh, yellowish rock under uh, um, uh, there, right? And, and here it's a paint. Under the bottom of the pond is a paint blue. So let's look at the spectra of those things. And I'm not going to talk about all this um, explaining those, but in simple, all of those things look different when we look at um, and, and using remote sensing images. And then there's a, and, and every day, like when you look at a white shirt, it looks white. Why it looks white? A trees look green. Why does it look green? It reflects the green light. Though. Excellent. So, so a tree, a tree, absorbs red light, right? Converts that to a chemical energy or biomass or things like that, and then it reflects green light. And that's why it looks green. A white shirt, it reflects all colors in visible rain. That's why it looks white. Uh, a, a blue blue jacket, it reflects blue light. That's why we see it's blue, right? And then, so what we are seeing is a reflected light. Your eyes are, are, are one a comp, uh, a perfect example of a remote sensor. You can see things from the stands. Uh, uh, um, uh, so, and what you are looking at, what you are seeing is actually reflected light. And what I'm showing here is exactly the reflected light. And then the higher the, this uh, reflectance is, is, is basically and an here up to zero to 80%, right? And then here's the, the spectra for the blue light. You see a strong blue light reflectance somewhere around here. And then the other water, the, the um, uh, under this you see a different uh, other water features is actually sh not showing blue and something like that. But the, the bottom line is what we see everyday life is a reflected light in blue, green, red. But unfortunately, our eyes cannot see anything reflected beyond 
uh, visible or uh, near infrared and, and those colors we can see. But things like vegetation, plants reflect significantly, like huge, in, and, and look at those spectral areas where like near infrared and, and then uh, heat reflectance and things like that. It's actually a lot of things we can't see. So what does remote sensing do is we design sensors to measure exactly how much light is being reflected in red, blue, green, near infrared and all of the spectrum from 500 nanometer here to 2500 nanometer reflected light, right? And then correlate that what's happening in the environment, what's happening in a plant. Just like when you go to, a, 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 to see a doctor, they measure your heartbeat and, and your um, uh, breath and the number of uh, blood pressure, things like that. We have instruments to measure blood pressure and, and photosynthesis and things like that for plants. And then those are actually relate to so-called reflected light. And now in the fall and, and especially this time, what you see is like trees and, and turn it to red or yellow or something like that. And that time basically colorful concentration and someone mentioned colorful, that's a great point, that in leaves um, uh, that died out. So the colorful actually absorbs red light and reflects green, now it died, so it does not reflect green light, but reflects reddish and things like that, right? So those are what we, uh, uh, what we uh, use remote sensing to detect and quantify and correlate that to yield, plant health, photosynthesis, and things like that, okay? So why do we care well, what's happening? And challenges in agriculture, and especially for Midwestern, uh, uh, region is it's it's big and and this is an agricultural region right so worldwide and he has the increase for food production um, by uh, uh, 2050 about we need to have about 60 uh, three percent more food in the future in next uh, several decades to feed the population in the world right and then and on the other hand agriculture irrigation systems are less efficient or could be more efficient and, and there is a demand for improvement in technology. Then about um, and, and then we talk about climate change, we talk about um, CO2 or, or um, uh, methane and number of gas emissions and how uh, the, the emissions and, uh, is, is polluting the uh, uh, environment. So Agriculture is actually is responsible for about 50% of uh, gas emissions, and this is a big thing, right? And, and we need more food, but how we can produce more food without causing more damage to our, the air we, we breathe, or um, uh, for our environment or water systems. And then this is an average uh, age of uh, farmers today in the U.S. And then you can imagine another decade or two, this will be about 70 years old, right? And then I bet, I um, uh, don't know, maybe um, there's uh, young um, teenagers I see a lot and, and kids and how many of them would be interested in farming? Anyone interested in farming? Oh, okay. That's good. <laughs> That's encouraging. Okay. so. So those issues, so, so how do we address those issues, right? And then, um, and, and one thing we have been doing, I mean, this is also um, a lot going on recently, like in St. Louis Science Center, we established a agriculture exhibit, and you may have visited that, and so basically there is, um, uh, we grow crops, soybean, corn, a number of things like that, and then, and this is a small, but very smart robot, and it can measure air temperature at different levels. It can measure soil uh, temperature, soil moisture, pH value, value. What we do is we can program it to walk around the field, collect soil moisture, and then report that back to a system there uh, or on your tablet, right? 
So you can see what's going on and, and what plots are uh, actually uh, um, and need this irrigation and what's happening with, with the soil exactly, right? And then fun thing is, um, it turns out, um, this is a, the one most attractive thing at Sinus Center for Kedis at this age. Okay, so that's a good way to, um, to encourage and kind of uh, uh, educate our uh, children about agriculture, how important it is, and and, and also, um, and we we fly drones. We have been demonstrating drones in the uh, science center just to give up give up uh, a, a notion to public that it's not a bad thing. And and we know we have heard drones, yeah, targeting bad people, and and we know that. But there's many good things with drones. You can use for research. You can do uh, many things more efficiently. Imagine. You are a farmer. You have hundreds of acres of field to farm, right? It's very difficult to go every day. You run across the field and, and see what's going on. Imagine you have a cage, just like a chicken cage, and where you have 10 small drones. And then you press a button, door opens, drones fly, and then talk to each other. Hey, I covered this field, you covered that field. And then five minutes, and collects imagery or hundreds of acres of fields and on your tablet, on your phone, on your hand, right? You can see, hey, what's going on? Red color there, what's going on? Maybe it needs water or a stone damaged it yesterday and things like that, right? So um, that's what we are envisioning for the future and, and, and technology is there. I mean, drone and manned aerial systems, I mean, in Europe, decades ago, and this has started, and there's less regulations, where I, uh, I don't know, but the, the basically there was, um, and, and our market, our regulations here has not been opened up for uh, civil research or use uh, for drones until very recently, right? But this technology has been developed in Europe, Japan, and many other countries decades ago. Um, but it's, it's really a, um, a new era for, or new um, uh, um, technology and with tremendous opportunity today. So why we should worry about, and uh, this is a global map of water stress and projected water stress under future climate. 2012, we had a major drought in Midwest. And, and, and I think, um, I forgot the exact number, but it's about 14 billion or some uh, lost due to that drought in, in agriculture. And um, now this is what future scenario look like uh, under future climate. And what our red areas here is as areas will be in uh, significant water stress or less water. And look at Missouri and, and Midwest, somewhere around here. And that's where areas, I mean, will, will be um, uh, in, in a water stress in 2025 or 2013 in, in, in future climate. And then also, uh, and, and most of those areas, India, East China, just like uh, US Great Plains, uh, Midwest and East China, this part is, is area for huge agricultural with uh, agricultural production. So all of those areas will be under water stress and, uh, and affecting agriculture and food production. Um, and also how uh, will that affect crop yields? Whatever red uh, colors here, what I'm showing, and, and areas where uh, the, the project um, crop yield like um, uh, up to minus 50%, up to 50% less crop yield we expect by 2050. So what we are talking about is most of those areas in red color areas and, and um, there will be a significant reduction in crop yields due to climate change due to changes in rainfall and precipitation. So what we are looking at is um, and on one hand, we have to produce more food to feed like 63 or 70% more food than today to feed the growing population by 2050. On the other hand, what we are, will be looking at is, is drought stress globally that would cause 
up to 50% reduction in crop yields than today, right? So those are problems. And then uh, what about in Midwest? This is a temperature change from 1900 to 2000 and even 2010. And then and reduction crop yield, soybean, corn in Midwest. And you see there's a linear trend. And also, uh, an, and, and future climate like 2041 to 2070, you see the number of dry days and difference than today. So there are more days will be in stress and drought, uh, water stress, and, and like um, and due to high temperature and then um, and less soil moisture. And whatever you see, Missouri, and this it will be in the, uh, the, the really high um, uh, uh, stress and high temperature by 2050. So it will have significant effects on Missouri agriculture and also Midwest. So that's about water, right? And also there's another term, ozone. And ozone in higher atmosphere is good. It blocks ultraviolet radiation. And, and, but the ozone on the ground and, and near surface, it's bad. It causes a number of other issues. I mean, when it will, um, and most significantly, uh, most important, it will affect, again, crop yield. It's a gas, yes, but it damages young leaves and then during its growth stage and causes uh, declines in crop yield. This is a figure I've borrowed from one of my colleagues who actually worked for NASA for 32 years and then um, joined it. Uh, to St. Louis University. So this is his work, okay? And then this tri-state area in Missouri, Illinois, and, and uh, uh, Illinois, and the, those, those areas. So this is a soybean yield, and what you see is red areas are actually uh, high yield areas, right? And this is actually a surface ozone. And then you see wherever there's high concentration of ozone, the red means higher concentration. And you see a, a, a lower crop yield or soybean yield. And, um, and of course, there is a, a, a series of studies, statistical analysis been done to, to justify this. But this is a visual and effect you see and how it spatially correlates. So more in increase in ozone minus will have less uh, yield. And in the future, and then USDA scientists recently found ozone also affects corn and has a number of other types of crops as well. Okay, so how do we do this? And then the way we do this is and 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 more uh, um, invest on in technology developments and either technology that monitor agriculture and or uh, improve irrigate efficiency of irrigation systems in agriculture and number of things. And remote sensing is not something new. I mean, 1980s, uh, this is, uh, yeah, 1862. And, um, and, and we were curious about the sea, earth, ground from sky. And then we used balloons to do that. Um, and then, and, and later on, actually, um, I, I'm gonna pass this slide. But pigeons were used to remotely sense and cities and urban areas. And actually, those pigeons were equipped with, with cameras here. Okay, this is an imagery of uh, a, a European castle obtained from a camera on the mounted on a, on a pigeon in Germany. Um, so this is in 1900, right? And then now, and in 1957, and sometime. And, and, and Russia launched a first civilian use, uh, set, uh, no, first actually largest um, uh, environmental satellite called Sputnik in, in 1957. In 1960s and especially 72, and NASA launched a series of satellites, have been providing data since then. And um, as soon as it's in the orbit, it has been like circulating the Earth, providing data, right? And then and European Space Agency in 2002 launched a very large satellite. It's huge, right? And then now we have hundreds of satellites. Those are we know it's, it's for civilian use, but there are many and we don't know. And like you know, for national security or a number of things, like imagine every week there is a satellite 
uh, lunch to the sky and think about how many satellites you may have, right? It's not even become a concern or problem for and become a, a trash in the in the upper space. Um, so we are at that level and hundreds of satellites have been providing data for us and, and, and day and night and we are utilizing. And the recent trend in remote sensing has become uh, to develop more small, cheaper satellites. Like this is a shoebox satellite. You can launch hundreds of them from International Space Station and you can see a single, sh you can still see a shoes on the ground from International Space Station, right? That level of satellites here. Yeah, there's a TED talk about microsatellites. And then more excitingly, recently, like unmanned aerial systems and drones, so called, and, and become very much fun and creating a multi billion uh, op uh, industrial opportunity uh, for many areas. So, what we do is then, and we use uh, uh, remote sensing sensors, okay, and our eyes cannot see beyond visible, but sensors can see beyond visible and what's in there. So we develop sensors and use like sensors on the ground. This is an unmanned aerial system, manned aircrafts, and we um, and and then satellites, right? And then we look at things from local scale to all the way up to regional and global scale to address food security. And we set up experiments in small scale, um, but those experiments are meant to build models, develop an algorithms, and then scale up that to uh, uh, entire uh, country or globe using satellites, um, at, uh, orbiting satellites. So um, the focus of today is more on like um, my talk uh, focused on unmanned aerial systems and how it can be very useful for research. And, and unmanned aerial systems, that's an uh, FAA, Federal Aviation Administration definition. And there's also another term called unmanned aerial vehicle, same thing. Remotely piloted aircraft system, same thing. And mostly term from Air Force. And drones, it, it's, um, yeah, drones, it's more and in the past used to target bad people, right? But what we call is UAS, unmanned aerial system. And basically systems like that, um, that provides us data for a variety of uh, research and, and other applications. And by the way, this is a test site we set up in Columbia, Missouri in a, a corn field and where we are studying how corn and, um, and, and maize and uh, sorghum how much water they use, what's a sustainable way to grow, to, to get the same amount of food or, or um, biomass or energy um, while and, and using less water and things like that. We have been studying um, that, that um, uh, topic. So those are my lab and, and where students enjoy making, uh, creating new toys and instruments and, and feeling like they are changing the world uh, with those technology. And, and these are 3D designed parts and those drones are actually built in my lab and variety of sensors are, um, are mount those and um, those are uh, field site. And those sensors are actually expensive and, and like five or ten years ago we couldn't get those sensors. That's NASA or European Space Agency. That's toys for like big country, uh, federal agencies. But today it's, I mean, this is a $70,000 instrument and a researcher <laughs> with funding, I can buy it, I can get it. So this is a uh, hyperspectral cameras and then um, um, and, and, and deployed on different systems. And hyperspectral imaging is another area really become very popular today. And if you watched Big Hero 6 movie, right? There is an episode, say some uh, like, like um, yeah, you have uh, you have allergy to peanuts or this that. Uh, you are not happy today. Do you remember that um, that part? So basically, it's a hyperspectral camera. If you saw that, if you uh, rem remember, uh, recall that, and scanning your body and telling you what you what's your feeling and what's the problem in in your health and things like that. But of course, that's a movie, right? Mm -hmm. But 
the technology is um, it's not there yet but and, and making some good progress in hyperspectral imaging and this that um, and zero robots actually in the field they can pick what what um, avocado is ready to harvest or what um, uh, uh, I mean uh, uh, tomato is ready to harvest things like that and machines are working to do that and using those sensors you know it's become more affordable and 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 um, uh, uh, and developing so this is another field we set up where we we have been studying soybean and different varieties of soybean and 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 how um, which uh, genotypes or which species can uh, live in harsh environment and things uh, like that um, so <clears throat> and and where we build models and to monitor food security so what I'm going to show is first a case study and, and using drones for, to study food security. Um, and again, we wanted to know this is a uh, very large project funded by National um, Science Foundation, about 20 million grant to Missouri to study agriculture. And, and many organizations in Missouri a part of that research and we are one uh, portion but mostly working on remote sensing aspects of that. The overall idea is how we want to understand how climate related water stress affect Midwest agriculture. Can we detect yield loss or potential issue, issues for crops like early as early as possible and then so if you know like weeks early something is happening we can prevent that actually become an issue or reduce crop yield, right? That, that's the goal. And then how we can apply this to an entire nation or globe and issue and address the issue related to food security. And um, we did experiments. This is an area actually in St. Louis area and, and a, a, a NASA aircraft flew over and collecting data. We, we were on the field collecting data. So that's one way we scale up our results from ground to uh, aircraft. This is actually the NASA aircraft flew at about 20,000 feet. Um, and then other test sites. And again, this, on this map, whatever these red areas are test sites where we have been experimenting the effect of ozone on crops. And you may notice so-called so ozone gardens and run by one of my colleague, Professor Jack Fishman. Um, you, you may notice that in, in sinus centers, there's a grants, one in Grants Farm, a number of areas, those are areas we, we experiment the effects of ozone on crop yield. And in those green dots are areas where we set up experiments to see how climate-related stress or um, uh, uh, that affect crop yield. And this is one view of an experimental field, and this is another site. Um, we have been looking at and again a number of systems and and all and built in our laboratory students were trained and to FAA standards and, and certificate to fly right um, and we collect data and this is one of this uh, soybean field what I'm showing here is this is an, an just visible image of the field and then I am measuring chlorophyll content from that drone and it's giving me like whatever red areas where there is like chlorophyll is almost dead like and, and plants are doing really bad and then those grow uh, green areas are where actually plants are doing really good healthy and you may notice that in the borderline here that's actually commercially uh, grown um, soybeans those are uh, uh, other two different gene species we want to know which one is really um, uh, grow well and then this is nitrogen concentration and when you have more rain and this that nitrogen deficiency become an issue when you over fertilize your field that nitrogen are less used and end up in the water we drink right and causing issues in water quality so what I'm showing here is the concentration of nitrogen in in plants and whatever red area I means less nitrogen absorption and, and bad growth etc so this is this is just one example of how we can use the technology to to look at um, 
crop growth, nitrogen concentration, and also we can uh, estimate biomass of plants. And then this is another cool experiment. This is actually a hundred year more older uh, field was set up. And we set up uh, like uh, root growth barriers, like plastic barriers to restrict uh, uh, or drain water out. And that plastic barrier is, held, uh, is, is placed at about 0.3 meter or 30 centimeter depth then 45 centimeter then and all the way. So basically the shallower the root depths, the less uh, water that plant gets, right? This is a natural environment we simulate stress um, and, and water stress. And then one of our experiment is actually this year. And um, we have a monitor of course all the time, but we had one dry week. It started at July 15 and that July 22, there was no rain and perfect window for us to see the effect of stress on uh, soybean crops. So this is July 16, and you don't see any stress. And then July 20, this is the panel where the, the drought is more strongest than you see, and visually you can see the effect. And then July 22, and then stress developed to other panels. And, and this is just visible images, what we can see, but the remote sensing can tell us what we can't see. And this is again the same day. This is from a unmanned aerial system and very clear, even the same panel, the, the water stress gradient is different. Some areas are really exposed to significant stress. And we also see stress on those panels from sensors. This is actually from a satellite flying our uh, 900 kilometers above, right, above from the surface. And we can see the stress de uh, development on, on all of those panels. So it's a nice example of how, like, in a satellite, on manned aerial system, and we are able to detect same stress effects on crops, and, and that has significant implications to scale up our results from field to regional or global scale. And then again, another um, uh, same data set, but showing different methods, showing highlighting the stress. And in the middle, actually, it's a canopy temperature from unmanned aerial systems. And those are, uh, this two is satellite imagery, same field. Uh, those, and then we also did a diurnal uh, experiment, like from morning to afternoon, how crops respond to stress. Can they recover or not? And what's the tipping point that crop cannot recover anymore and exposed to significant stress and addressing uh, things like that? And basically, this is a visual imagery, what you can see. You don't see visually on that day, we couldn't see any stress. But from sensors, you see all these dots and all, all of these areas that are actually plants are suffering. And um, um, so even within a day, right? And, and, and those are actually uh, uh, photos taken, and this is one of our fields, this is another field, and this field, um, so and, uh, one of our um, unmanned aerial system is flying, collecting data sets. Um, and then, the, the, so what I'm gonna do is that I can detect stress, so, and, and most important part of this research is being able to tell crop yield months ahead. And this is a, a, a one of our results and, and is uh, where we use those images, early season data, to predict terminal yield and, and, and months, three months before. So um, it's, and um, um, that's what I'm showing on this figure, really nice prediction. And the implication is, is that it's June, and, and assuming soybean, right? It's June, it's still, soybeans are growing. And I am predicting your yield, like, which is going to be harvested in October, like three, four months before. So, so basically, and the, the idea is, and um, we use machine learning technologies, drones to predict your yield and, and find out and how you can improve that yield or what's missing, nitrogen, fertilizer, or water, or what's, what, you have, uh, what, what you can do 
to prevent yield loss or improve your yield and our technology can tell you um, uh, we can tell you what's um, um, uh, what's possible so um, let's see um, an exciting part of our work as well and also we do a lot of outreach and again in science center flying drones here this is a drone is flying and this is our experiments and if you go there you see uh, our logo as well St. Louis University National Science Foundation and that's us um, working with science center and, and um, working on outreach and uh, education uh, issues and you see on this field and those corn fields are actually different varieties. Uh, uh, one plot is really sensitive to draw, uh, water stress. One plot is tolerant, and we are sh and we we showcase how uh, crops responding to stress. And um, um, so, yeah, and this is a cool uh, 3D view actually generated by a drone of the Science Center egg exhibit. Um, and then another interesting part is this is an infrared temperature map of Science Center and, and this is an visual imagery. And what's interesting with this, this is collected by a drone, is that these two types of roof, all white, look same material, right? But if you look at temperature map of these two types of roof, one looks really cool, cold, the other one is really warm. So the implication says the type of roof material you use for your uh, house or um, any construction that has also significant implications for our climate, environment, and things like that. On one roof, it, it all same looks same material. It's all, but <clears throat> what you see is one is really uh, absorbing a lot of heat, right? One is actually reflecting all heat away. What's the result is less heat is stuck on the surface. That's actually good. It reflects out, right? But um, on, on this one, it does not. Um, uh, so those are actually um, uh, those are actually reflecting more. Those are actually absorbing that heat and keeping for itself, and then. The, the, you have to spend more t on, on cooling as well, and number of things. Um, and again, another view of the same field, Sinus Center and, um, and a crop field is here. Um, yeah, this, this, is, this is a good uh, results as well. So basically, those two soybean field, one is irrigated, this is rain fed. Those four plots, two different corn varieties, this two is irrigated, this two is rain fed. And then and you see there, I mean from those images we can see very clearly those rain fed ones, tolerant ones are really growing well. And then the other one is like simulating future climate, water stress, not doing well, etc. So those different colors and, and the, the, the colors like reddish color means more healthy uh, uh, plant grows. And then whatever yellowish or other colors means uh, plants are not doing well. Um, um, our team and, um, and, and actually collaborators from Washington University, uh, Danforth Plant Science Center, those uh, uh, PhD students in my lab, and also other collaborators from Harstow State University. So on this part of the research, so impact and what we think is like and um, have positive impact on Missouri agriculture and in 2006 Missouri agriculture generated about 33 billion revenue right 99.3 percent of Missouri uh, 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 income uh, or revenue and also it employs about 3,000 uh, 378,000 uh, more jobs in 2006 so that's a big for us, for the state, for agriculture is big um, sector, um, and also um, and and many other outreach and activities. Um, that's the impact of this research. Um, next, um, this is another research actually funded by uh, Department of Energy Advanced Technology Program, and what it is is. And again, in, in set up experiments in Kansas, this is in Maricopa. So there's about 
500 different genotypes of energy sorghum. So what we are doing is just like you let and, uh, uh, players play and you pick the best soccer player to compete on nationals, we are selecting the best sorghum genotypes to produce future energy. Okay, so in a, a, a sustainable energy. So to do this, and, and this box, and this is actually a two, three million dollar instrument, um, in this box we have all types of sensors and, and collecting data day and night, right? And then we have drones and satellites, again doing the similar experiment and identifying which one of those sorghum uh, plots or genotypes are really doing well in, in uh, drought conditions or this that so that could be used to generate um, uh, future uh, energy. Okay, this is another uh, research we have been collaborating with um, Danforth Plant Science Center and then uh, 10 different, 10 more organizations from East Coast to West Coast, um, from South to North. And so um, those are on water quality research and on uh, uh, food security. Now on water quality, and this is another issue, I mean, we drink water, uh, our, the drinking water comes from streams, right? So, um, and agriculture and water, they are, they are related. It's not, we can't look at them as a separate system, it's because one example I just uh, shortly, uh, briefly mentioned it was nitrogen, and you fertilize, depending on your uh, crop growth and time and rainfall precipitation, that fertilizer ends up in the streams and then and, and we may end up drinking that water, like algae blooms is, is um, a big issue and sometimes it's toxin, right? And this is, a, you may heard the um, uh, Lake Erie uh, in, in Toledo, Ohio in, in August 2014. This was actually made in New York Times, that was a big algae outbreak. People were told, don't drink water from your tap, right? And then this is a satellite view of um, uh, algae bloom and developments in Gulf of Mexico. Basically all fertilizers, agriculture we do in Midwest and in Mississippi Basin is, and all goes into Mississippi River and killing fish and other species in Gulf of Mexico. And that's another and, and, and big thing we, we worry about, right? So when we study water quality, we look at a number of things like suspended sediments, like, uh, uh, like when you see a, uh, suspended sediments, it's like dirt in the water, right? And then other things, and, and it's hard to see, like nutrients, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and also cyanobacteria or blue-green algae, that's an, and some species of cyanobacteria is toxic, and that, that's um, an issue for uh, our health too. Now, the way and most of the time the, the monitoring water quality is done manually by boats and this is a USGS facility that's set, set up in the streams collecting data sets, right? And this is expensive, maintaining it and going to the field and one day you can, if you can cover like 10 points, measure, right? And think about Mississippi River, think about streams, Mark Twain Lake, Carlisle Lake, all streams. It's very difficult to do manually. So our mission, our goal is to develop remote sensing techniques, again drones and, and, and sensors, to do this in somewhat automated way. So we can save cost and, and be more effective. And most importantly, and the goal is to predict what's going to happen in water quality or algae blooms. So, um, and what I'm showing here is those are num uh, stations, locations of an US Geological Survey stations or stations managed by other uh, organizations where water quality is being monitored. But many other areas, look at those streams, there's no, and this is a huge area too, there's no monitoring sites. So that's what we are doing using and, and remote sensing to do that. Um, what I'm going to show today is a brief uh, study we have done in, in Lake Decatur, Carlisle Lake, and then all of those monitoring sites 
we went out, grabbed sample water, fly drones, collect data, and then and and to see if we can uh, monitor water quality using sensors and and drones. And um, our field work, and again we have handheld uh, instruments like those, and um, uh, we went with boats, and and those streamers we grab sample water quality, fly drones with sensors. And then this is me actually uh, scanning that water, my students. Um, so, and, and, and the idea is build equation like, and y equals to ax plus b type of equation. The x is remote sensing imagery, y is your water quality, right? So ideally we collect an imagery from a drone or from a satellite and then be able to tell what's your water quality in your streams. So that's the type of uh, uh, research we have been uh, uh, working on. And then um, those again in a, in a, in a Merrimack stream, uh, a drone we are flying in that area. So, um, and, and this is um, a more challenging but exciting research still under, under development. And again, remote sensing has been um, long used in monitoring algae blooms. And again, though those are examples and actually showing um, an issues um, in uh, al algae issues um, that's causing fish killers and as a number of other singers. And then, oops, mm -hmm. it happened. Almost there, <laughs> yeah. Um, again, this is uh, satellite images um, collected on July 28, 2015. Um, our uh, Lake Erie and then Lake St. Clair. And whatever those colors you see, the uh, green, uh, that's algae bloom. So those satellite data are free as long as you are able to Play with satellite imagery free. You can see your streamers. You can see your and and water quality and things like that. Um, and we have been funded by many organizations, including, of course, Saint Louis University and um, and NASA, National Science Foundation, and and Electric Power Research Institute, RPE. That's DOE, uh, U.S. Geological Survey. And the most fun part of my talk today uh, are several videos I'm going to show um, and um, now let's see um, this is so this drone is collecting data and then this is following him. So see if it's doing a good job or not. Um, and let me see here. This is one of the field I showed. in Columbia, Missouri. There is a hyperspectral imaging sensor on, on, on here collecting data all around. And Another video here, yeah, this is a close-up view of that uh, same. Field, let me see what else I have. Yeah, crop scouting. 
<coughs> so Well, with that, um, um, I'm ready to take any questions, if you have. Is there any uh, commercialization of the agricultural imaging? Yeah, um, a absolutely. We are working on a number of pa uh, technology and, and patent applications right now, but it's, it's a big business now. Like in California, many areas, it's already in, at industrial scale. Like you make an agreement, uh, a farmer makes an agreement with a company, they come every week, fly, collect data, and tell you what's going on. Yeah, it's, it's a big business right now. Okay. You didn't mention livestock at all. Did you use it to scan any livestock? <coughs> or have you used it to scan any livestock? Uh, no. Actually, um, that's a very good question. And one of my students from St. Louis too, actually, he wants to use uh, hyperspectral imaging to study animal happiness and scan them and see if they are happy or, <laughs> uh, or what's their feeling and things like that. Very interesting question. But like um, an industrial scale, like um, in food production, hyperspectral imaging is often used in like say, you have a lot of apple, packing, packing a lot of apple, right? Which apple is good, bad, and it's scanned, and then on the other hand, the machinists will pick the bad ones out. Yes? Yeah. Question, young man? Oh, oh sorry. Uh you or mentioned early on that uh, the average age of a farmer is 58 years old. Yeah. Uh, does that count for employees of like larger commercialized farming industries, or is that just local farmers? Yeah, everything counting okay. an average. Right. Yeah. I don't know if we can go website here. Mm, yeah. Okay. So. Can we detect it? Yeah. Uh, it's just remote sensing lab. Dot org. <laughs> yeah, if you go to media, please. So this is our lab website. Um, uh, you can see all types of research. I'll bit go down a little bit, please. Um, it's going. Oh yeah, yeah. So more. Um, yeah, uh, you can learn a lot what type of research we have been doing and, and cool kids in our lab doing research. So those, if you are in high school, you want to go to join the cool kids club, you're welcome. <laughs> and um, send me emails and things like that. Question? How large were those drones? Uh, it can be as small as very tiny to, I mean, all sizes, like... Uh, the last ones. Uh, it's maybe this size, yeah. like in the, in one direction, like this. Yeah. Um, we don't live in metric world, but <laughs> it, it came with like um, in meter, like the long one leg, the length is one meter. Yeah. yeah. So it it it's large. Like this is this is large ones, but we have very small ones as well. Yeah. <laughs> How does your research compare to like what Climate Corporation is doing with their field view and very, very interesting question. Yeah, I want to know more what they are doing, but but I know they are doing a lot of um, uh, crop agriculture and and uh, uh, things like that. Um, but I don't know what exactly they are working on. How closely do you work with the seed developers? Because you know a lot of companies are developing drought resistant seed, and yes. disease resistant seeds, etc. Yeah. So what, what is the linkage between the work that 
you do versus the work data versus complementing the work they do, how much interplay is there between the organizations? Yeah, um, uh, we, uh, uh, Saint, yeah, great question. Uh, St. Louis, I feel like it's a, it's a world plant and, and research center, like Danforth Plant Science Center, if you have visited. Like, there are scientists who works on plant uh, genomics, gene editing, things like that. And actually, uh, we work with them. And, and there are uh, the sci and also USDA scientists, right? And for sorghum, for example, like 500 different types of hybrid species, and is actually developed in the labs, and then planted in the field, and then we have been testing with them. Uh, my lab, uh, we don't have a direct collaboration with uh, seed developing con uh, uh, companies right now. But we have good collaboration with researchers like in Danforth Plant Science Center or Mizzou Biology Department, um, who actually works on this type of research. James, uh, do you know if there are any are there any um, I guess industrial applications versus agricultural and water? Like our company does a lot of you know industrial work. And I thought other applications we could use drones for either surveying. Or just, you know, I guess company, um, maybe the efficiency of insulation on the roofs, for example, like we saw photographs. Any applications that we think of or use for that? Absolutely, yeah. Actually, in uh, uh, real estate uh, companies, are using drones for um, one and when for marketing and one obvious applications, right? And then two, yeah, and thermal imaging and and your roof insulations. That's actually the best way to. Check out. It's it's it, it doesn't cost too much. Uh, I mean, the smaller um, like drones, uh, commercial ones, you can buy for fifteen hundred, and do all the fun you want to do, you want to do. I mean, today is like from inspecting power lines, right, bridges, and those are just a few examples uh, of applications in industry. But there are many. Uh, have you been able to harness weather yet, or is that is that something that is harness weather for and energy? Bring it to where it's needed and take it away where it's not. Mm, yeah. Is that on the horizon? No. Um, I don't. I I don't know that. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. I, I yeah. I'm a remote sensing. Scientists, so I, I, yeah, that's that's not my field. Can't comment. Are you aware of? Uh, is there any like tension? Is there is there publicly available imaging data, and maybe private commercial? Is there a tension between that? And uh, I can see that this imaging data could be used in futures markets. People trying to make money. Mm -hmm. Mm. Off the buying and selling futures or whatever, they want they would like to have this data. Um, I don't. They complement each other, right? Um, the most of the, uh, there are levels, different levels of data sets, right? Many of them are free, but there are very high resolution. The images from, like. From space station, you can see a shoe on the street, right? That level of images. There are some becoming freely available, but mostly that's still commercial. You have to buy, right? And then, uh, on the other hand, there are uh, uh, NASA images collected by NASA satellites. Most of them are free, like, but it's for agriculture, environment, and this that. So it's uh, it has a different use, but. The, the, there are businesses using freely available data, but it's not just providing that data as it is, because as it is, it's without training, uh, it's very difficult to interpret, right? They take those freely available data and turn that into a product. And for example, like 
yeah, your crop is doing well here, you need fertilizer there. That information can be generated from freely available data, but proprietary patent software or applications. So, and um, yeah. Great. Thank you again. Thank you very much. Thank you.